You're living at a time of extremism, a time of revolution, a time when there's got to be a change. People in power have misused it, and now there has to be a change, and a better world has to be built, and the only way it's going to be built is with extreme methods. And I, for one, will join in with anyone, don't care what color you are, as long as you want to change this miserable condition that exists on this earth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, um, uh, let's see. Well, this actually gets into to sort of one of my points here. Okay. The, the religious guy, the, the, it's all an issue of religion, okay? So, so it's all an issue of perspective, and the words you're being, it actually comes all down to language. All these people in the United States that go they're absolutely crazy over any form of Christianity are the most ignorant of individuals because they are all dealing with uh, Christianity as it has been presented in an English format. I'm not saying they're bad individuals or anything. I'm simply saying they are ignorant of their own religion. For instance, let me ask you, you're an educated, uh, or you're actually a schooled uh, Bible scholar, as I understand it. So yeah. what, what... Then. You know yeah. this then. Uh, what is the word that translates into the English phrase Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost? Okay, either in Aramaic or Hebrew, uh, both of which are, Hebrew is actually phonetically merely Sumerian that's been transliterated into a new new alpha, uh, alphabet. It is right. exactly the same language as Sumerian. So, okay. uh, if or you go Chaldean, all the way actually, a lot of the Bibles in Chaldean as well, but it, which is your correct, exact correct. right, start part Sumerian. Okay, and if you go all the way back to it, the word that they have, that has been translated into the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost, and I heard this just the other day and it made me laugh because there was this fellow on TV saying, oh yeah, the Holy Spirit visited our church and we did all this kind of stuff. And that's fine. I, I like their their general, you know, fellowship issues. However, the word that is translated into Holy Spirit in any English version of the of the Bible is Rauch, R A U C H. Okay, R A C R A U C H is not. A, uh, it does not mean Holy Spirit. Does not mean spirit. Does not mean ghost. Does not in any way refer to any of this. It is in fact a designation. It is as as much a designator as is the TR, whatever it is, for those little floaty triangle ships. What, what's the designation for those? The spaceships that the military has here, those triangle guys? Oh, the, 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 TR, the TR-3B Astros? Okay, okay, TR-3B. Okay, Rauch is exactly the same as a TR-3B. It is a designation of a specific kind of spaceship that would go from the mothership down to the planet. It right. had curved, curved wings. It could hover over both water and land. And in fact, if you go back to the Sumerian origination of that word, it shows it as the, the actually drew the description of the thing hovering over both land and water, as opposed to this other kind of ship which cool. could not hover over water. And well, so, they, so, and they talk about and they talk about the the the, the flying mountain of God. No, that, there's yeah. no. Okay, here's the whole thing in Bible in the actual uh, uh, Aramaic or Sumerian or Hebrew version of the Bible, there is no word in there ever that translates into the word God. There is no word in there that translates into the word Creator. Uh -huh. That's why I say all these people are ignorant. They've been led down a path by the people that have changed that language in order to control them. Well, but what, about, no what, about, for, what about Elohim? Elo, Elohim, Elohim, are, Elohim, Elohim come from are, the sky. Those are the interlopers, okay? okay? Elohim are does not mean God. Elohim means those are the, the second group to screw with our DNA. <laughs> okay? Seriously, it is those who came from the sky, and the, the, uh, these are not our creators. These are, in fact, acknowledged as the enemies of those who actually engineered our our species and these enemies of the, uh, the people that engineered our species were called the Elohim and we have the whole Anunnaki and all the uh, L, L this and L that, uh, uh, L key, L link key and all of the female versions that all came back to DNA modifiers but we existed here in a form before they got here and this uh, the Bible in its original forms was, a, was an account of an invasion by an outside force to our planet that is inimicable to the to the beings that had originally created us and that we are under the second phase of that invasion and that they in fact left the archons and all the other problems which led to the writing of the gnosis bibles and so on so these are simply books that are attempting to transmit knowledge to us that we're under attack constantly and the english stuff is is just um bunk absolute bunk I and mean, let me they, and, and one other thing too to add to the the the, the rauch comment is if you look at the angelic messengers that are called that we translate as, as cherubim the actual pronunciation of that in the hebrew is karaboom which is actually the sound that they made when they tore across the sky karaboom correct uh, like this like the sonic like the sonic booms well here's the whole thing about all of the uh, that aspect of it 
Uh, it's replicated all the way through the Sumerian. We see all the Gilgamesh uh, stories that uh, filter back in, and basically the Old Testament that are that are simply rewritten. But this all goes all the way back to those poor fellows, right, that are getting the the absolute hell stomped out of them, the Dogon. Because the Dogon really are the last remnant of the true story of the creation of uh, of our species on this planet, and their story was maintained throughout the whole of um, uh, our species up to the last couple of catastrophes, and then this weird group came on in and they started warping it to their intent, and we have these religions that are the monotheistic, uh, basically paternalistic control structures that are attempting to take the real story of what happened to us and where we came from and morph it into a structure that says this off-world being is controlling us and wants us to feel guilty about this sin stuff and the whole thing. And they develop this very complex story that is so complex, it's like any great conspiracy theory. The more complex, the more believable it is. And so we all had a tendency to believe it when we were children, but at some point you have to grow up and examine the facts and go back to the source material. And if you go back to the source material, you discover that there were the groups before the Adam and Lilith. I don't know how many people are aware of that. There were, you know, a yeah. number of species before. Yeah. And those those are the, um, uh, the, they're discussed in the Nummo myths, basically, by the Dogon. And they've got the real story, because those are also, the Nummo myths are found up here in the Salish people. The Salish people, the Tinglets, uh, all of the tribal people in the coastal areas, all from the Pacific Northwest all the way up through Alaska, have the same set of myths as do the Dogon in Africa. Now, the Dogon used to live on the, on the uh, Indian Ocean side of Africa and were forced out by Muslim invaders to, into their area now on the uh, western side in Mali, and they're again under threat by the Muslims. Hmm, yeah, there's Mali again. Okay, right. Yeah, okay, huh. right. And they're they're uh, they're under threat by the Muslims now, who are attempting to destroy the knowledge. That's the whole point yeah. of chasing the Dogon. Okay, and, and also blow up their blow up their idols and right and their else. libraries and such. Correct. But anyway, the um, the Salish up here have a very much more complete version of the of the same set of myths, and they actually talk about us being created. Uh, by the uh, the Earth having a set of beings on it, uh, not our species at all, back a dinosaur kind of an era a long time ago. Along come these uh, amphibious beings that are uh, mostly female, but uh, when it's time to procreate, some of them can become male. But they prefer to be female for a lot of different reasons related to their immortality. So these mostly beings, female, but when they want to be male, they can be. Uh, yeah. uh, these guys come from the Pleiades, so all of the Sirius uh -huh. myths and all of this, it's all true. And, and or they came from um, Sirius, and they're heading to the Pleiades. To the seven sisters they were migrating because they had problems with Sirius all of the, oops all the issues with Sirius uh, a B and C that the Dogon knew about so do the Salish so did the Tinglet up here in, in Alaska they have the same set of myths they call the the Nummo they call them changer and they talk about how all the creatures were created by changer and then some time passed and along come these beings these tall beings that the locals up here uh, have various nasty names for but are basically the Elohim and the uh -huh. Anunnaki okay wow. and they also screwed with our DNA, except for those peoples who were able to hide. Aha, the Tinglet and the Salish, and others around the planet, and that they were all in contact with each other and so on. Anyway, from this group is where we get the Lilith myth. Okay, Lilith is the female um, uh, remnant of the people that were there before uh, the last catastrophe and before the patriarchy came into existence in the age of Pisces. And then uh, here's something else, uh, just a little point to keep in mind. If you want to find out who really rules the planet, find out who you're not able to criticize. Thus I say to myself now, uh-oh, uh, it used to be just that it was Zionists um, that were hidden. Now they know they're exposed and so they know they're uh, we, they know that we know that they're insinuated in the um, uh, body uh, politic of um, uh, Jewish people. So now they're saying, uh oh, can't criticize Jewish people at all, way, shape, or form. Um, and uh, you're not able to criticize Israel without going to jail or getting a lot of heat for it. And therefore, these are the people that are ruling over us. Uh, I wonder who rules over them. Who are they not allowed to criticize? Now, personally, again, I think most of them are all full of shit. Uh, real translation of the Bible. If you really want to get into that, there's a, just an excellent linguist out there, Mauro, M-A-U-R-O, Biglino, B-I-G-L-I-N-O. He's Italian. He's got a series of uh, videos out with uh, English subtitles. Uh, he's a brilliant fellow. He uh, worked for years for the Vatican and actually translated the original works of the Bible, which they kept secret, and then they fired him when they uh, heard that he was going to go out and start talking about this. 
and uh, I think it's called uh, The Unexplored or The Unexplained Bible, and uh, you'll see it on YouTube. It's just quite fascinating. Anyway, along the, those lines, after you've watched that, go and look up this place called uh, Gobekli Tepe. Uh, if you go and look it up, it's G-O-B-E-K-L-I. Uh, uh, T-E-P-E two words uh, there's an umlaut over the O because it's Turkish um, it's in Turkey it's on a hilltop it is not a religious site uh, in spite of what everybody's saying oh it's the world's oldest religious temple and all of this bunch of horseshit. Uh, what it is is a, an attempt to convey knowledge as to how we were originally created. It is the Nummo myth inscribed in stone, an elegant, beautiful stone that was either uh, cultured or laser cut with precision we couldn't match today. There are, they, these things are ethereal. They were put into this park. It was a park that people would go through and examine the cultural history of our species and where we came from and our relationship with our progenitors, the species that came here and made us. It is not a religious site. It does not in any way go towards religious worship or those kinds of feelings. It is a scientific site, a museum site that you would sort of like a museum of natural history. And what they did, what makes this astounding, was the people that built that knew that the planet was going to get the shit kicked out of it in one of these transitional cycles like we're in right at the moment. And they thought, aha, we need to save this if we can for all the future humans so that they too will know what we know, the true nature of our species. And so what these guys do? They meticulously buried it. I mean, they went to the trouble of, you know, arranging the dirt in it to bury the thing. Uh, so they would be protected. So they covered it with earth such that it would be protected for our generation. Now, unfortunately, we should have dug it up 13,000 years ago, kicked the crap out of anybody telling us that, you know, the Anunnaki and these off-world god people or off-world aliens are actually gods and uh, understood who we really were and we would have progressed to the point where, you know, we would have, uh, Star Trek would have occurred about uh, probably 11,000 years ago. We would have been off our planet and moving. Uh, but we didn't find them until just now, the, the, uh, another cycle. Who knows how many cycles this thing has been buried, at least two. And so what I think we ought to do is to put all the stones right back where we found them and cover the thing up again because we're in the middle of a cycle or in the, in the midst of a, the beginning of the cycle and leave all kinds of notes as to where to find it. Because if we don't, it's going to be destroyed by the cycle we're going to be going through and then we will have undone all the work that those uh, magnificent beings did way back when. And by the way, it has nothing to do with religion. It is, again, a science uh, museum site telling you where you come from. Absolutely fascinating. And it describes the Nummo myth down to an um, incredible detail. And if you want the real Nummo myth, go look up um, uh, G-R-I-A-U-L-E. That's the author. And it's called Conversations with uh, Ogo Tomelli. And uh, he's a, um, uh, a Frenchman that wrote all this stuff up. Just fascinating. And anyway, so Gobekli Tepe is um, uh, also fascinating. It validates the Nemo myth and, and also speaks to the um, uh, issue of the um, mistranslation of the Bible. And it validates everything that uh, Morrow is saying about uh, the biblical sequence being taken over by these mind control people when originally the Sumerian text was once again an attempt to tell us, hey, watch out for these rauch, for these things that you people in the future would use English to call holy ghosts because they're a spaceship and they come down from a mothership and they abduct you and nasty things happen to you when they abduct you. And by the way, the rauch, unlike these other things called the, I'm going to mispronounce it, I'm sure, the swaft, uh, but the Rauch can hover over water, so you're not safe on boats. Whereas with the Swaft, you are. They can only hover over land. And so you get over water, you're safe. Uh, and also, these are the Anunnaki and not our creators. These are the uh, interlopers that came on in here, and they've been screwing with us. And we don't like them much. Uh, basically, the whole, if you go and look at Morrow's real translation, uh, the stuff the Vatican is keeping secret from you, and you want to read it a particular way, as I do, you can say that basically, the all of the Old Testament has been perverted from its original intent, which was a warning saying, hey, watch out, Rauch come, and they do anal probes. Um, and we don't like them much. But these goggles, these night vision goggles, and by the way, I have third generation night vision goggles. If you want to, I got mine from a guy by the name of Ed Grimsley. You can get them through um, Google. Uh, there are other generations available now, so you need to talk with somebody like Ed, uh, who's an expert on these. I am not. I simply use them. One of the things I wanted to say about these, though, was that the last few times in the, in the winter, when I have had clear skies and have been up at the appropriate time and had the time, uh, uh, to use the goggles for a bit in probably less than a half an hour in the last three times 
Uh, so this is extraordinary. Each of these three times I've seen what I call the drive-in movie spaceship. And I call it a drive-in movie spaceship uh, because I'm an old fart. Most kids won't understand the concept of a drive-in movie. Uh, a drive-in movie is basically you sit in your car and they project the, f the, the film you're going to watch, the movie, from behind you onto a giant screen ahead of you. Sort of a huge version, a collective group version of a projection TV. Well, this spaceship is sort of like that because what happens is you see this flash of light in the sky that is that is basically rectilinear. That's what is, is really interesting about it. It is uh, atypically straight-edged. Uh, not hard-edged, but straight-edged, and um, uh, cambered corners, so it, it, uh, in that sense it's a little on the fuzzy side. Anyway, there's this like sudden bright flash, and it's as though you're sitting in the middle of a dark night in the um, car, uh, snuggled up to a nice uh, cuddly human, and all of a sudden they turn the lights on on the movie theater, and the screen is illuminated. Big white flash. This is the milliseconds before they start actually showing them the film or their commercials and then the film. Uh, so you see for a second you just see this just pristine white and that's what this looks like. And the curious part of this is when you see this white flash it's ahead of the spaceship and the spaceship is kind of oh, I want to say it looks like a very sleek version of a um, uh, truncated uh, stainless steel kind of water bottle and uh, with its um, with the blunt end of the water bottle, the bottom end, aimed at the um, uh, the screen. And what actually happens is there's a gap. You can see the gap because the spaceship is actually uh, illuminated uh, with some of the reflected light from the uh, screen that, or a big hole of light that's been uh, opened up. And then the spaceship just suddenly jumps into the light and the whole light closes behind it and the spaceship is gone. Now, the interesting part for me is that as the spaceship is around, this is not a one-time occurrence. In order, I counted the other day, it does this very, very, very rapidly, so it's extremely hard for me to keep up with it. But I am certain that there were over 16 of these little flashes of lights in, a, in order for it to cross the entire arc of the sky. Uh, from my particular view here. And it's true I'm hemmed in with some tall firs, but I still have a, a from the northeast to the southwest, which was the direction that these uh, ships take, I still have a good enough view that I've got probably, oh, I would say 60 degrees of the um, uh, complete arc. Uh, so uh, it's a good, goodly distance. And in 16 of these little flashes, the ship is across that distance. You just Obviously, there's no noise or anything, but it is just extremely fast. If you were going to make this into a, a cartoon or something, you'd want to have some kind of a noise just, just to indicate how fast it is. And, and it, it, these little flashes occur. You get to see for the millisecond as the ship jumps into the hole. And then the next flash occurs ahead of where, uh, not in a necessarily straight line because it was able to curve, it took this sort of curving arc across the, um, uh, the visible sky here that one night or that one early one morning. Uh, they, all the three times that I've seen these uh, this year, they've all been coming out of Cassiopeia and heading um, to the southwest in terms of my orientation uh, terrestrially. The last time I'd seen these in... I think probably 2010 or 2011, I had a couple instances where I happened to catch the, the appearances of these ships. Uh, they were headed from the southeast to the southwest, so their path now is entirely different. I'm assuming they're, they're um, you know, an intelligently operated thing and not an organic life form, but I would no way, have no way of determining this from, uh, from my view down here. This is very fascinating. I also know that when these guys show up, any of the little triangular uh, floaty craft that are up there uh, will scurry, scurry, and get real close to the big box craft uh, as these um, light ships go through. So I don't know if they're scared of them in the sense of they don't want to let them know they're there, you know, cat and mouse kind of thing, or if there's some kind of, you know, um, external energy that flows out of them that presents a risk to these triangular guys. But they sure move when the uh, when the these uh, drive-in drive movie spaceships show up. Okay, so page after page of crud.
called uh, The Unexplored or The Unexplained Bible. And uh, you can see it on YouTube. It's just quite fascinating. Anyway, along the, those lines, after you've watched that, go and look up this place called uh, Gobekli Tepe. Uh, if you go and look it up, it's G-O-B-E-K-L-I uh, uh, T-E-P-E, two words. Uh, there's an umlaut over the O because it's Turkish. Um, it's in Turkey. It's on a hilltop. It is not a religious site. Uh, in spite of what everybody's saying, oh, it's the world's oldest religious temple and all of this, a bunch of horse shit. Uh, what it is is a, an attempt to convey knowledge as to how we were originally created. It is the Nummo myth inscribed in stone, an elegant, beautiful stone that was either uh, cultured or laser cut with precision we couldn't match today. There are, they, these things are ethereal. They were put into this park. It was a park that people would go through and examine the cultural history of our species and where we came from and our relationship with our progenitors, the species that came here and made us. It is not a religious site. It does not, it's sort of like a museum of natural history. And what they did, what makes this astounding was the people that built that knew that the planet was gonna get the shit kicked out of it in one of these transitional cycles like we're in right at the moment. And they thought, aha, protected for our generation. Now, unfortunately, we should have dug it up 13,000 years ago, kicked the crap out of anybody telling us that, you know, the Anunnaki and these off-world god people or off-world aliens are actually gods and uh, understood who we really were and we would have progressed to the point where, you know, we would have, uh, Star Trek would have occurred about uh, probably we're in the middle of a cycle or in the, in the midst of uh, the beginning of the cycle and leave all kinds of notes as to where to find it because if we don't, it's going to be destroyed by the cycle we're going to be going through and then we will have undone all the work that those... Uh, magnificent beings did way back when and by the way it has nothing to do with religion it is again a science uh, museum site telling you where you come from absolutely fascinating and it describes the Nummo myth down to a um, an incredible detail and if you want the real Nummo myth go look up um, uh, G-R-I-A-U-L-E that's the author and it's called Conversations with uh, Ogo Tomelli and uh, he's a um, uh, a Frenchman that wrote all this stuff up. Just fascinating. And anyway, so Gobekli Tepe is um, uh, awesome. And it validates everything that uh, Morrow is saying about uh, the biblical sequence being taken over by these mind control people when originally the Sumerian text was once again an attempt to tell us, hey, watch out for these rauch, for these things that you people in the future would use English. The swathed you are, they can only hover over land. And so you get over water, you're safe. Uh, and also these are the Anunnaki and not our creators. These are the uh, interlopers that came on in here and they've been screwing with us and we don't like them much. Uh, basically the whole, if you go and look at Morrow's real translation, uh, the stuff the Vatican is keeping secret.